Um, but I've got a lot of ground to cover in a short period of time. Um, each one of these uh, words would, would probably, uh, you could devote half an hour to it. Um, so I'm going to move, move through it fairly quickly. Um, and uh, hopefully you'll, you'll find some interest here. I guess what I'd like people to, to think about is, you know, what does this mean for you? What does it mean for your company at your stage um, of growth if you're a junior or at your stage of, uh, of, of uh, sustaining uh, if you're um, working for a major company? Um, and, and hopefully that will generate some good questions at the end. So think of the questions as well as the, the content here. I'm not getting to this to advance, here we go. Um, so where do some of these ideas come from? They're not, you got nothing there? Okay, so I need some, yeah, here we go. Let's try, try again. All right, so um, these are not all my ideas, they're recycled. Um, there have been some excellent uh, ideas that come out of the CET Discovery Days, um, which have been held three times now over a four year period. Um, there's also some material out there on YouTube if you want to listen to some uh, dis discovery gurus and luminaries uh, like Silito, uh, Sig Mossig and others. Go to, go to the YouTube, you can find out what they think about uh, what makes successful exploration. Um, Mara um, Exploration Managers Conferences, uh, uh, those, those uh, have been very useful in terms of corralling some of this, this information. I'm going to talk a little bit about government assistance and tax incentive schemes. Um, the tax side of things I'm not so keen on. The, the government assistance, I think, is, is creating a huge amount of value for the industry. Obviously, there's a lot of personal uh, experience and bias that comes into this. Um, as outcomes, perhaps think about, reflect on, you know, is is the right place to be, greenfields, brownfields, or blackfield, actually in the mine, underground, looking for thing, new shoots, um, developing existing opportunities that are full potential. Where can the greatest value be added? Um, there are significant organizational changes that happen between being a, a successful junior and being a major, uh, and we, we should not forget about those, but there is a middle ground, something that used to be called medium-sized companies. They don't exist, they went extinct in a period of around about 2005 because they were all taken over by the majors. Uh, is there a, a role for medium-sized companies to come back into the industry and, and do they actually add more value uh, than other parts of the industry? And we'll, we'll talk about that. What makes exploration teams successful? And, and that again depends on, are you exploring in the greenfield space or are you exploring in the brownfield space? They're different spaces. You need to have slightly different skill sets, slightly different approaches to be successful. Do these government incentive schemes and tax uh, incentive schemes actually support exploration or do they distort the market? And I'll be focusing quite a lot on uh, the story from Canada and you can draw your own conclusions but uh, I'll try and guide you into a particular conclusion that I, I like. Um, and as I said, reflect on where, where does your company sit, where does your um, role in the industry and, and where might it be going next. Um, so, blue sky or red tape? Juniors are all about blue sky. Um, if you're not an op optimist, you shouldn't be in a junior mining company or exploration company. Um, there's no room for pessimists there. Uh, you need to be entrepreneurial, and as we'll see in the next uh, few slides, uh, some of the characteristics of entrepreneurism and success in any industry are the ones that you need to be a successful junior explorer. But whatever you, you've got there, you need uh, quality projects and, and good management, and this is what sells it to the market. If you've got uh, some, and probably more the people than the, the, the project, people will believe as an People will believe, that investors will believe in people who have a track record. And if you can gather people who have a track record together, they will believe that those people will gather quality projects. So it's very important to have the right branding um, in the junior sector. <coughs> News flow is paramount. As soon as you stop talking to people, your share price goes down. Um, so you've got to have things to say. You've got to be active. Uh, you've got to be drilling. Um, and that goes along with, with the issues of 
delays. So if government causes delays, if red tape causes delays, if, if green tape, brown tape, black tape causes delay, uh, heritage issues have, um, have been one of the things that have been raised a, as a question earlier. These can cause tremendous delays, and for juniors that's, that's really not good. They can't sustain delays while they don't have the capital back in to be able to uh, run for a long time without, uh, without uh, being able to uh, cash in on the news flow. Um, they can contract ex expertise in, um, and you really need to have that survival instinct. The difficulty for a lot of juniors in the, in the red uh, uh, writing there is that they commit to marginal projects, or worse still, zombie projects. Projects that have been recycled several times through previous um, booms uh, that were never going. These are the these are the things that are worse than the T3s, um, and a lot of these come back again and again, and it, it, that talks back again to the the quality of the projects that's required to be a successful junior. Um, Building a mine is a high-risk proposition for an exploration group. It's not the core skill set, and quite often it's, it's important to change teams, and in some cases to sell the project on. It's not, it's not, you're not the right group of people to take these, um, these projects forward. And unfortunately, the statistics show that most junior companies lose money for their shareholders. So as an investor, you have to be cleverer than average, and you have to be able to, to sift through which Juniors are going to be the ones that deliver for you, both financially as well as in the discovery space. On the majors, because you already have something, you've got to sustain it and grow it, and you've got to have, therefore have a pipeline of projects. So that does speak to opportunities which are more grassroots, but as we'll see when we look at Canada, most of the grassroots exploration there, in fact the vast majority of it, uh, is being done by juniors. Um, so it's it's interesting that although that is the natural uh, feeding space, the natural uh, grazing space for majors, it's not a space that they're currently occupying. Um, there's obviously, if you've got an, uh, a project, there's brownfields opportunities. Um, there's a lot of issues there with, with uh, compliance and government, governance. Um, and, uh, but the opportunities in, for the majors is to uh, develop a corporate culture that is sustaining and develop specialist internal uh, services, so not to have to um, focus on employing external expertise all the time in order to drive their ideas. Unfortunately, majors have very, become very risk averse. Um, they spend a lot of time crunching numbers and saying that exploration is, is not adding value for them. They have ludicrous hurdles. Um, they, they don't understand that uh, the projects are often grow with time, and this is particularly true of, of gold. Um, deposits where um, often they go into production and the, the full size of the resource is not found until, until later. Um, uh, and big mining is, is beginning to lose, I think, the will and the wit to be able to manage the investment cycle because they're not doing enough exploration. Unless you're able to, uh, to fully value exploration upside, then you will pay over the dollar uh, for, for the, what you're paying for. So management styles change as you go from um, being an explorer to being um, a major miner. Uh, when you're an explorer, you need to be a strong lead, you have strong leadership and be entrepreneurial. Once you become a major, you need strong management and bureaucracy. We also focus on those blue uh, areas that you actually need to turn down the leadership and entrepreneurial uh, aspect if you're going to be a successful major. What you want is actually to bring in some strong management controls because without those you won't uh, survive for the long term. For other uh, industries, you, you can look at this both product, uh, product growth matrix and there's a lot of different directions that small companies can go in. Uh, you can stay down here in the, in the bottom left uh, corner and develop more market penetration. So if you're a nickel miner, like Western areas, you can acquire more nickel assets and grow in that space. Or you can diversify into new markets. You can have new commodities that you bring into the portfolio as a way of developing. Um, another way of developing is through innovation. Um, we've heard a lot about bioheat, heat bleach, and other type um, innovations. Also innovations in exploration. They will drive um, opportunities for growth. Where we, we have difficulty is, that, 
in, in the industry is we don't spend a lot of time developing markets from scratch. In other words, developing markets for our, our metals, for our products. We're, we're mostly price takers. Our um, uh, vast majority of, pro of metals, major commodities, are sold on the LME um, and they're sold into the open market. And we, we take the prices that we're given rather than develop particular um, markets for those um, commodities. There are some exceptions, um, uh, and I guess some of the, the mineral sands uh, um, products uh, are exceptions. There are also some, some particular types of things like iron ore, uh, the, the iron ore that goes onto magnetic tapes and, and, and magnetic disks uh, in, in the past has been a, a niche market for particular producers. So there is an opportunity there, I think, for us as explorers to think about what our products could be used for, as well as where our products are coming from, and that's a space that we don't we don't spend much time in, I don't believe. Trades for Explorers. This is actually a list of, um, of, of um, characteristics for the achieving personality for the uh, uh, profile of greatness, which is on the web as the world's 100 greatest people were analyzed. And these were the, uh, the 10 key, um, key aspects of personality. And these are the aspects of personality which I think are just you can just put in there and say entrepreneurs. This is what the junior sector needs. You've got to have focus for them. Um, it's no good having a lot of energy but directing it like a blunderbuss at umpteen different things. Preparedness. Um, this is actually a quote from Oprah Winfrey. Opportunity is, uh, uh, luck is opportunity meeting preparedness. If you don't know what you're looking for, if you don't know what luck looks like, then you won't recognize it as it passes you by. Uh, you've got to be convinced about your story in order to be able to sell it to other people. And you've got to persevere. You've got to be creative. You've got to be curious. You've got to be tremendously resilient in this industry. But you've got to also take risks. And this is where, again, I, I believe the major companies have become excessively risk averse um, in their management style um, uh, to be uh, fully uh, successful in the exploration space. And at the bottom there, a sense of higher purpose. True believers are more valuable to you than dollars. If you've got people who really want to be in this industry, who want to be in this industry for a long time and believe uh, in the exploration process, then, then that's more valuable than having access to dollars. So focusing. This, this chart is, I don't know whether you can see it from the back, but on the left-hand side here was the, the jump in commodity <coughs> prices that went uh, on in, in the lead up to the last boom and things like rare earths at the top. On the right hand side though is the, um, the change in, in volume that resulted from those commodity price rises. As you can see there's no correlation between the volume and the price. So a lot of the things that rose in price were very small volume, volume markets. And so chasing things like rare earths, graphite and things like that it all may sound very, very uh, uh, um, uh, sexy at the time, but it doesn't create any long-term value because it doesn't cr create a long-term value in the industry in terms of, of volume. And this one down here, this blue bar is iron ore, which actually created the most volume growth. And it was only really, uh, relative to some other commodities, were fairly modest, uh, only doubling in the, in the value of, of the commodity. So, if you want to be a successful explorer, what what do you need to, to do? First of all, you need to raise enough money. Um, too often, uh, explorers go to the market and unfortunately raise only enough money to go to the next milestone. You need to have a vision that I believe that is going to get you closer to the discovery point. Um, some great examples in the recent past have been groups like uh, Musgrave Minerals that were able to um, raise $20 million, which has lasted them five years. And that's, that's allowed, allowed them to to, to manage that a huge portfolio of assets that they had in South Australia. So if you can raise enough money, then you can do good work and do a good exploration. Um, you've got to be able to market your ideas, um, and if you don't have a good, a good grasp of your ideas internally, then you're never going to be able to market those externally to external groups. Um, you need to for, focus on being explorers, not, not uh, just geologists. So this, this actually comes from Mark Bennett from the CET presentation. Uh, there is a difference between being an explorer and being a, uh, a geologist. Um, sometimes it's about the science, but there is a, a science of exploration. I think 
more than we go through the CT um, discovery days, we're discovering that there, there are some traits there, there are some common factors that really do deliver on being successful explorers. And some of those hark back to that slide about entrepreneurialism. If you have those traits as, a, as, a, as an individual, you're more likely to be a successful explorer. Um, we need people with, with passion, you need to reward people. Um, and that doesn't just mean with money. West Mining uh, was uh, a company that many people wanted to work for in the 70s and 80s, and it wasn't known as being a big payer. But people wanted to work there because they knew they were going to learn, they were going to be trained, they were going to be mentored, and they were going to be involved with a successful team. And success breeds success, and if we can uh, create more success, we will have more success. And obviously, you've got to keep drilling. Um, being a, a sustainable major is a little bit different. And here, it's not selling to the market anymore. You've got to sell it to the board. Uh, and that's a very important thing to understand, is that managing the upwards and managing uh, the board's impression about what the value that exploration has is key. And I think that, again, is somewhere that we've let ourselves down, that most major companies' boards do not understand the value creation uh, that can be made from exploration. Um, and they see it as a high risk um, play. Because one of their major concerns is, is social license to operate. And when you, as soon as you start talking about risk, which is what um, exploration is all about, taking risks, then they start worrying about their social license to operate. To be a sustainable manager, you can't just sit at home. You really need to be a global group. Um, uh, think uh, in a geographic sense, globally, uh, scientifically, and technically. Involve the best people in the best regions and the best places. Um, and it's there's a lot of value uh, long term in, in in developing partnerships, and that's partnerships with the community, with industry, and, and government. And you've got to keep drilling. Now, we heard about that. You, you will not make discoveries without drilling. And there's no excuses if you're a major company. You've, you've got the, the funds to keep drilling. Um, and one of the key things uh, companies need to do, I think, is to monitor the, the total cost of exploration and divided by the number of meters they drill each quarter and monitor that. Because if you're not drilling, then you will not make discoveries. Um, and there's a, you know, several other important uh, uh, concepts there. Um, focusing quality assets happens at every stage. It can happen at the exploration stage as well as at the acquisition stage um, or development stage. Quarterly, uh, six monthly, definitely annual reviews of, of your exploration portfolio is absolutely essential. Um, you cannot. Um, have quality assets, you can't understand and manage your pipeline unless you have a review process. So now I want to move on to this sort of second part of my talk which is about um, exploration performance and assistance schemes. Um, so how can we uh, help ex our explorers be more successful? So this uh, this first slide is, is uh, an up uh, a, a more a global version of, of the slide that, um, that Richard put up first up. Where are the explorations, uh, where are the expenditures in the world and how they varied. And uh, whilst exploration uh, in Australia doubled uh, on a global basis, we actually saw a 10 times increase uh, from 2000 to 2012, from about $3 billion spent to $31 billion spent globally. And once again, we've seen the equal rapid decline uh, down in 2014 to, to $16 uh, billion. Dollars. And if we look at Canada, um, uh, which uh, in, in, certainly in the past uh, Australia has uh, seemed to compare itself with in a similar, similar size country, uh, although Canada is larger and slightly larger population, certainly a similar, similar size um, resource industry. You can see that um, the, those um, changes in, uh, in, in, uh, in exploration spend have been matched in, in Canada as they have in the rest of the world. One of the things that happened in, in Canada, though, was a change of, of financing that happened back in 1985 when the first flow-through financing for juniors was introduced. 
and you can see there's a, there was a, a strong peak in, in activity that resulted directly from that. Um, and, and that's really been something that has then grown. It's been like a, well, I won't call it a virus, that's a bit rude, but it's something that's, that's in, in, in integrated itself in the way that Canadians do business. So from back from 1985, when um, about 5% of the exploration was being done by, by juniors, it's now over 50% over of the exploration dollar uh, exploration spend exploration activity is actually the junior end of the market. Uh, and as I'll see, as I've developed this argument, that I, that I believe has been a direct result of this flow through share scheme. So this flow through share scheme has distorted the way that exploration is funded, and therefore it's uh, changed the way that people explore and the way the, the um, dollars that are being spent in the different sectors. Um, so range of uh, company types now, um, you know, 71 percent of all discoveries. Uh, in Canada were actually made, that's in terms of number, not, not, not uh, value, were made by uh, the junior sector in the last decade. Um, so that's where, where the, um, the trend has, has taken us. Um, now you saw this slide before, uh, the only thing that has changed a little bit, this is now Canada, you can see that even more of the value um, was in the discovery of the few, few tier ones and tier twos rather than the, the tier threes. So the Canadians uh, have have created more value through the discovery of larger deposits than perhaps in Australia. But that's not really the, um, the, the, the true message that I want to get through here that comes in the later slides. So this, again, for Canada, um, again, Richard's, uh, Richard's figures, not my own. So uh, if you've got some questions, uh, I'll ask him. But in terms of the return on value uh, on commodities, in Canada, it was gold, gold, and gold. Uh, in the last 10 years, that's the only uh, real commodity um, that, that added that you've got a real good return on. Um, and base metals were woeful, as they have been in Australia. Uh, uh, diamonds even more so. Um, and a lot of the, the money, the 50%, uh, no, no, uh, no uh, about 40% of the total exploration span, sorry, 43%, was on gold. Um, so you have to have a certain level of exploration spend uh, going into a, a commodity in order to have any sort of rate of return. But in Canada, um, it was gold. And there's also a breakdown that, that uh, Richard produced for that, the spend ver in greenfields versus brownfields. And as you can see here, um, brownfields are really quite successful. But that was again because a lot of that money was spent around gold mines. Um, and gold mines are places, as many of us know, where if you drill deeper and longer and more cleverly, you can often find more resources. Um, the Greenfield story has not been a very good um, uh, uh, return on investment, and that's where a lot of these flow through shared dollars have gone. So you're only getting a 30 cents in the dollar return for most of that money. And most of that money is, our, is the taxpayer's money. Taxpayers' money was directed into those schemes, and it didn't actually generate that much return in the last 10 years. I'm going to skip over this slide. Um, you can read it uh, when on the website later. Um, but how did the how did the senior companies compare with the junior companies? Well, we've seen a flip over, and we'll, we'll go back to some earlier data in the next couple of slides. In the last 10 years, the senior companies have not done as good a job of, of exploration discovery as juniors. But then they haven't spent as much money. Um, and there is a, an aspect of that, that the, the more money you spend, we've seen that really from, from Rich's slide, the more money you spend, the more money, the more things you find. Um, and you have to be spending at a particular rate, otherwise your, um, your headline costs, your, your fixed costs, become too high a percentage of your, your total costs. Um, so at the moment, junior companies in, in Canada are being more successful, generating a, a, a better return. But as you can see, those dollar returns are less than you get in Australia uh, and less than you would get in West Africa. So it's still not a good return. And this is in spite of the tax incentive. So if we go back um, greater years, so in, in Canada, we're very lucky that um, 
there's, there's uh, numbers like this that go all the way back to the 1960s that uh, Rich has been able to analyze. And as you can see, back in the early years, um, the major companies were doing a fairly good job. Uh, in fact, they were doing a better job than the junior companies. And they were spending more money than the junior companies. Um, and this is the decade when the flow through shares came in. And the junior companies didn't really do very much with that money at all, apart from spending. So in, in the decade that it, in, it came in, it didn't produce much. There was maybe some payback in the following decade, and uh, like um, Richard likes to emphasize, there's often a delay on uh, receiving the value from your, from your work. Um, but overall, uh, in the early part of that decade, when senior companies were, uh, were spending more money, they were being more successful than the junior companies, and they were a larger part of the spend. So I think some of these statistics really do relate to the amount of money that you, that you put into the, into the effort um, versus uh, other costs. Uh, obviously, these are average figures, and as, uh, as um, Richard would tell you, you know, the key is to be better than average rather than just be average. So this is what the trends look like over time. As you can see, up until the mid-1980s in, in Canada, really the junior companies weren't, weren't doing anything much. They started to spend a huge amount of money in the, in the 1980s. This is the flow through share scheme. And still, the relative amount of return on that spend was, was not great. Um, meanwhile, the, the senior companies uh, were trucking along and spending a, you know, what can be argued as a similar amount of money through, through that period of time and having a reasonable amount of success. But their success rate has certainly dropped off since the uh, since year 2000. Uh, here's, a, here's another uh, chart which, which talks to a different breakdown. And uh, when I was with uh, Luca, I asked Richard to, to try and break down on a global basis. And when you say global, we're talking about the Western world, not, not the CIS countries, not, not China, uh, where it's difficult to get accurate statistics. But what has been the um, relative uh, success of, of different types of producers? So single commodity producers, moderate producers as well as small, so trying to divide up that space between junior and, and senior. And what we can see here is that the interesting factor is that medium-sized companies were, were really being very successful in the, in the late 90s uh, uh, or, or during the, the, the 90s completely. They were really, this was, they were at the peak of their performance then. And there were a lot of medium-sized companies around them. Um, and they provided the best ec exploration economics. Uh, if you wanted to invest your money, you, know, you, you were getting a good bang for your buck by investing in the, in the medium-sized producer and the single commodity producer. Uh, but there was a massive drop-off in the mid-2000s. And this is no coincidence. That's when this group have stopped spending money. And they stopped spending money because they went extinct. Uh, this was the, the time when when MIM, Western Mining, Naranda, Phelps Dodge, Jubilee, Lion, all, all these medium-sized companies disappeared off the bourses and, and stock exchanges of the world because they were taken over by the seniors. So uh, the golden goose was very much not only killed, <coughs> it was hung, drawn, caught, and, and eaten by, by the seniors. Um, this is a complicated chart, but it just goes through the details of those, of those takeovers. And some of those uh, companies, like Western Mining, were phenomenally successful during their heyday at finding things. And, and rather than having the average chance of success of one in a thousand, um, they actually had more in the several percentages of success for particular commodities. So one of the things I think the industry needs to ask itself is how do we rebuild this middle ground? How do we encourage uh, uh, a concept whereby medium-sized companies can exist for long enough to add value to the industry, and medium-sized companies have that opportunity where they don't, they're not talking about survival all the time, and nor are they talking about sustainability and being uh, super good corporate citizens. They have that, that still that mindset to be able to subdivide themselves into, into hunting teams that can be very successful. Um, and uh, you know, we can think that there's, and, and long for them, but there, there are very few of them actually on the on the stock exchange at the moment. And maybe Independence Group is going to be the, the first of a new batch of, of that size of deposit. Uh, 
uh, of, of the class of, of, of minor. So back to uh, flow through shares. Uh, as you can probably tell, I'm not particularly happy with flow through shares because, I've, and it's not because it's not a good idea. It's just how do you manage it? an idea like this so that they, without knowing what the consequences are going to be. And there's now a super flow-through share scheme in Canada. So they've, this is this is flow-through share scheme on steroids. Um, so when did it first happen? It happened in 1985. We saw, saw the, the charts for that. Um, and it allows issuers to transfer the tax deductions through to the, the stockholder, to the investor. But the investor has to be a resident of the place of, of the jurisdiction, so you have to be a Canadian and invest in a Canadian company to get this investment. So everything has to be Canadian. Uh, it, and it really only works for junior explorers. And what that's done is suck the dollars that used to be spent by the students. They, that, that, these tax deductions are of no great value to the, to the majors. They can't take advantage of them. They can't raise money on, on them. But the juniors absolutely can. And at the moment, 70% or something of the money being raised by the junior market is through these flow through share schemes. Um, and um, so one of the, the other uh, issues of these flow throughs in, in Canada is that you've got to spend the money within the tax year or within the 24 months. Um, so some of that money is being backdated to previous years. You, you have the opportunity to that. That, that creates an even more... Uh, uh, dynamic of uh, requiring the explorer to hit the ground. But because they've already banked the deduction, guess what? They spend it regardless. They have to spend it by the end of that tax year. So you get a behavior uh, that's being encouraged whereby waste happens in the second, in, in the, in the ter roll down to that tax year. Those dollars have to be spent. Uh, and so uh, that's not a good way of managing exploration. So it's managing those, the flip over. The concept of a tax year is, 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 is a, and, and these sort of schemes, they don't work well together. There's now brokerage firms that are actually sort of collecting these um, tax deductions together so that you can have them in a portfolio so you don't have to invest in a, in a single asset. So it's almost becoming like, you know, the hedge funds are, are sort of getting into this. Um, but the super flow through scheme, so not only do you get 100% tax deduction for your exploration, you can now get 15% federal tax credit for grassroots exploration. And then you can get some variable state um, incentives as well. And what that means, um, yeah, as I said, well, over 70% of the money now being raised uh, for exploration in the, certainly in the junior sector is, is coming from these deals. Um, but, but look at this. Um, is this encouraging or distorting? In Quebec, if somebody investing $1,000, it really only costs them $335. Uh, it's what that, that money costs them, because the rest of it they get back in tax deduction. Um, and, and if you compare that with our poor Alberta, they're only getting half back. So um, this really does distort uh, the way the money gets spent, uh, and we need to be very careful about uh, these sort of schemes. Uh, Australia has recently introduced um, a scheme very similar to this, uh, the Exploration Development Scheme. Luckily, it's capped at 100 million, um, but we really need to think very hard how, how this scheme is going to add value uh, versus other ways of investing the taxpayer's dollars. Because this is taxpayer money that's going into the scheme. It's not, you don't create money out of thin air. It's, it's, it's money that could be spent on other things. And the sort of things it could be spent on are these sort of things state government exploration assistance schemes, which have arguably been tremendous in terms of adding uh, quality activity and adding um, useful geoscientific information uh, in areas where it was lacking and generating real opportunities for discovery. Um, and South Australia led the way from 2004, and there's a total of $41 million only has been spent in South Australia, but that's resulted in some tremendous um, uh, uh, discoveries, including Carapatina. Um, in Western Australia, the man looks a lot bigger, 130 million, but that's the royalties for regions. A lot of that money went actually into regional geophysics and geochemical surveys that were done by the survey, rather than giving money uh, in, in kind to run geophysics or do drilling. Um, 
and, uh, and New South Wales is now coming, coming along for the ride. Uh, Queensland and Victoria and Tasmania are a little bit slow on the uptake, but clearly this is another way of incentivizing and, and, uh, and, and improving and driving exploration. Uh, and South Australia and West Australia are really doing an excellent job of this. Um, just uh, Cara Patina, um, this is a story not only about discovery but also about partnership because when tech came on board, it was really not until the 50th hole that uh, when they got several hundred meters of 2% uh, copper and 1% percent uh, one gram of gold that the real uh, economic discovery or potentially economic discovery was made. So that again speaks to the, the fact that even when discoveries are made, we need the right, right partnerships to really drive and get the true value out of these um, out of these opportunities. So, um, <coughs> so just to sort of summarise and, uh, and bring together some of the things I've tried to talk about in this uh, wide-ranging uh, discussion, management styles, teams, and organisations have to adapt. It's it's a very different world being a junior to being a medium-sized company, to being a senior. Um, and there, there are different spaces, there's different opportunities for those group, and if you're reflecting on where you are in this, in this, uh, in this zoo, um, then where do you want to go next? Because where you want to go next may mean you need to change out your management team, may mean that you need to become a, a producer rather than an explorer, and that requires very different skills. Or you want to stay in the, in the uh, in the uh, exploration space and you don't want to produce, you want to sell your asset. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a viable uh, option. So uh, don't forget money can be made by simply selling an asset rather than wasting an asset. Um, Brownfields exploration is still providing good payback. It's certainly in certain commodities and certain jurisdictions, uh, especially in Canada for gold. That's, that's a, a good news story. Um, some of the statistics on Greenfields exploration, though, speak to some factors which I think which are, are, are dragging those numbers down and, and I think money is being wasted. Uh, we already heard that money is being spent on activities that don't have any, any, uh, any value in the ground. Um, uh, so we need to be very careful about our greenfields uh, activities. Uh, successful exploration teams, particularly in the junior sector, they, you have to be entrepreneurial and they, people who are successful in that space share uh, characters that drive success in all exploration, in, in all business. Uh, and we need to nurture that and mentor that and, and bring that to the fore where, where it can add value. Um, once again, we're reminded that the real value is in the discovery of these larger deposits. Um, and that does require a team effort. So if you're a junior explorer, having a relationship with a major is going to be an important way of, of getting uh, best value. Um, Strategies um, can involve discovery, acquisition, and innovation. One of the strategies nobody is really employing is developing new markets for our commodities. We rely on other groups to develop markets for nickel, for copper, for uh, rare earths, etc. We're not we're not in the, in that space, and we could be we could be uh, leaders in that space. Um, partnerships are very valuable uh, in the brown fields uh, ground. Consolidation is an important aspect. Um, Pre-competitive data will bring things in, but we need to be very careful on the way we manage uh, uh, exploration investment market and tax incentives that we provide can actually end up providing us with, with actually a lower um, discovery rate, a low success rate, which will unfortunately then scare the investors away and not actually do what that is supposed to do. And will the medium-sized explorers return? That's a good question. Thank you.